Hi everybody, today we are going to be talking about public policy and conflict resolution. Um, so we're going to kind of breeze through these notes looking at what public policy is and what conflict resolution is and how it relates to this process. So your objectives for this video are to one, define the following key terms, public policy, persuasion, negotiation, consensus building, and compromise. And then two, describe how all levels of government and the three branches of government are involved in making public policy. So first things first, what is public policy? This is any government action that deals with a particular issue. This is how we solve problems in America through the government. So uh, you can think of an example being oh, the state of Ohio, and many states have done this, but uh, making a law that passengers in the uh, front and back seat have to wear a seatbelt. Right? That would be an example of public policy. But public policy does go beyond just making the law itself, um, and we'll kind of get into that here as we move through these notes. So this is an image that you have on your notes, and this is the continuous cycle of public policy. And we're gonna talk about this, um, kind of break it down step by step. But as you can see, issues start and end with the people, right? The people of our country through popular sovereignty, right? We are the ones that have the authority. We have interests, problems, and concerns that ultimately we want fixed, or we want the government to do something about. And that's what public policy deals with. Now. Through linkage institutions and things that connect us to the government, these issues get into the government on the policy agenda and then are made into policy through the policymaking institutions of government. And those would be our branches of government. The policy is then enacted and then the people are impacted by the policy and the process then starts all over. So let's kind of break this down a little bit. What is the policymaking process? Like I said, it always starts with the people. People bring interests, problems, and concerns. And this changes over time, right? What is concerning for people, what is of interest to the people, uh, changes with, with you know, what's going on in society, where they're at in their life, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the policy agenda are the issues that attract the serious attention of public officials and other people involved in politics at any given point. So it's kind of on the agenda to be discussed. You can look at it that way. Um, you know, basically what are people talking about? What should we as lawmakers be thinking about making? As I mentioned, this is constantly changing, right? Uh, I would say our, our policy issues right now, um, healthcare, right? That's huge. That was not on the forefront or on the agenda. Um, you know, a couple decades ago, immigration, abortion, those are all big issues that are currently on the policy agenda today. Now, the level of government is important in our system because if you remember, we are a federalist system. Federalism means that responsibilities are divided between different levels of government. So policies take place at those levels of government as well, right? There are just local issues that local governments take care of, state issues, and of course, national issues. So you also have to think about where the public policy is getting made and where it affects and who it affects. So when we're looking at our notes, I want you to first try your best and uh, think about what level would you take the following policy concerns. So potholes on your street, would that be a local issue, a state issue, or a national issue? Banning standardized testing in schools, local, state, national. Going to war against Russia, local, state, or national. Getting a driver's license, local, state, or national and paying social security taxes, local, state, or national. So take a moment, pause the video if you need to, and then we'll go over the answers. So local is going to be potholes on your street, right? Imagine having to call up the federal government to come fix a pothole on Glenway, 
right? That would be ridiculous. It would never happen. The federal government has bigger issues to take care of. So that is a local issue. Banning standardized testing is going to be a state issue. Going to war against Russia is going to be a national issue, right? Only the national government can declare war. Driver's licenses is a state issue, right? Looking at your ID, it says Ohio on it. And this one was probably tricky for some of you. Social security taxes are a national, a federal tax. That's why it is a national um, policy. Okay, so once we've decided what issues are important, we need a way to have our um, ideas and policy concerns go to the government itself. And that is how uh, linkage institutions play a role here. These are channels or access points through which issues and our preferences get onto that policy agenda. And there are four main linkage institutions, political parties, elections, the news and media, and interest groups. So those are going to serve as ways that we the people can get our ideas onto the policy agenda. Now, how policy is implemented and created and enforced are through the policymaking institutions. These are where policies are actually made. And you can look at it as both the level of government, so where, like in our nation, is it federal, state, or local? And also by what branch? How is the policy created, enforced, and interpreted? So policy is made usually through three different ways. The most common is going to be legislation, but it could be administrative acts, right? Um, there are things called pres uh, executive orders, rules by the bureaucracy, and then, of course, judicial decisions as well. And this often involves multiple levels and branches of government. So we're going to see the interaction between the three branches of government that we talked about. So Congress, the legislative branch, in this policymaking process is going to make laws. They're going to be the ones that write the law for a health care bill, for example. The executive, the president, is in charge of signing the bill into law or vetoing it. And then also when it becomes a bill or becomes a law, excuse me, they're executing the law, making sure that it is being enforced. And the president uses the bureaucracy to help. Those are agencies that are out there implementing the law, right? For example, let's talk about a law um, that would raise the drinking age, for instance, to 21, right? That was a thing back in the day, like in the 60s. Um, so that's a law that raising the drinking age to 21. If you're under 21, you can't drink. To enforce that, we need the executive and the bureaucracy to make some rules, right? Because if there are no rules or consequences, that's going to have no effect on people that are under 21. They're going to drink. So that is the role of executive and the bureaucracy. And then the courts, like the federal courts, the state courts, and, uh, you know, the punishments that they lay out, they interpret the laws. And that's going to impact the way policy is viewed as well. So remember checks and balances. This is where checks and balances is coming in. And I have this diagram here just to remind you guys. Remember, in this process, there are very, uh, quite a few, I should say, ways that each branch of government can check the other branches and make sure that they don't become too powerful in this policymaking process. Whether it's vetoing a law, declaring a law unconstitutional, overriding a presidential veto, right? Impeaching. Those are all ways that our branches of government check one another in this process. <clears throat> so then the policy itself is the end product. This is what we end up with. And this could be something like a an expenditure, right? The government's going to pay for something. This could be a new tax on the people. This could be a new law or a regulation. Or sometimes it's decided that nothing needs to be done and it's a non-decision or a non-issue. Policy will then impact the people, right? Because these are laws and regulations and things that people must abide by. So the questions that we look at now, and this is what make it continuous, does the policy solve the problem? Does it create more problems? And obviously, policy is going to change over time. So I wanted to give you an example of in China, 
um, there was a huge population issue um, a couple years ago, like 20, 30 years ago. And there arguably still is. And they implemented something because of that issue, which was a one child rule. Um, you could only have one child in China. Did it solve the problem of population uh, growing too quickly and not having enough space? Yes. Right. If you can only have one child, that's going to reduce the number of people. However, it also created more problems because what would happen would be you saw a rise in um, infanticide, killing of babies, a rise in abortions of baby girls, and also the rise in adoptions of baby girls. Because um, in China, wanting to pass on the family name is a very big cultural characteristic. So the boy babies were favored. So it did create more problems as a result, but that is the policymaking process, right? And then it would go into, all right, how are we gonna fix this problem now? Policy also changes over time. The role of government in our lives has changed, less versus more. And also foreign policies changed, right? As at various points in our history, we've been isolationist. At other points in our history, we've tried to be global police and get involved in other issues outside of our own. Now, public policy, anytime you're trying to get a group of people to agree, that's going to probably create some sort of conflict. You're going to have disagreements, especially when it comes to laws and issues that have, um, you know, ideological or political party leanings. So there are four methods of resolving conflict that we're going to take a look at here briefly. Persuasion, consensus, negotiation, and compromise. Persuasion is where you're trying to convince someone of your position using logic, reason, or emotion, right? This is, you know, you're trying to get people on your side, prove to people that your side is the right side. An example of this in government would be the election or election campaigns, right? Candidates are trying to persuade you to vote for them over another candidate. So this is one way that conflict can be resolved. And persuasion is important as a uh, diplomacy skill. Right. As the chief diplomat, the president has to meet with leaders of other countries and persuade potentially. And that is important when it comes to things like treaties, alliances, trade deals. Right. They're going to try and persuade those leaders to be on the United States's best interest and our side. Another uh, way to resolve conflict is going to be something called consensus building. Consensus means an agreement and different groups in this tactic are going to search for common ground or areas of mutual agreement in order to solve a conflict. So you're trying to uh, find agreement among disagreement, right? What is it that we can all agree on uh, that we can, you know, come to some sort of solution? The goal here is to try and satisfy the key interest of all the parties involved in the decision, right? So like, for example, if there was a planning of prom and you were trying to come to a consensus on the rules for prom, whatever that would look like for senior prom, right? Seniors are going to have a much different interest than parents and school administrators, right? When it comes to rules, right? Seniors are probably gonna be more relaxed. Parents and administrators probably are gonna have more uh, stricter or um, more being more concerned about placing or putting rules into place. So you can see how you would need to find an agreement among all of those groups that everybody can live with. Negotiation is discussion aimed at reaching an agreement. So this is kind of in between consensus building and our next one, compromise. Um, negotiation's goal is to bring about an acceptable solution to both parties and both of them leave like they feeling like they won, right? So you both get something out of that discussion. The agreement satisfies what both of the groups or both of the people want. And then finally, we have compromise. Now, compromise is difficult to do because each side has to know that they're going to give up something. They're not going to get something they want 
in exchange for something in return. So think back to our great compromise when we talked about at the beginning of the year, right? The big states and little states wanted very different things when it came to how they would be represented in government. Big states, population was a uh, representation based on population. Small states, representation was equal. At the end of the day, they decided to compromise and create that two-part Congress so that they both get something they want while giving up other things. Okay, So that is an example of compromise. So remember, your goals for this video were to define public policy, persuasion, negotiation, consensus building, and compromise, and to describe how all levels of government and the three branches of government are involved in making public policy. So go ahead and make sure you have everything filled in, answer the questions here quickly in Edpuzzle, and then hop back on over to the Google Meet so that way we can debrief these notes as a class. Um, so bring any questions you have with you to the Google Meet, and I will talk to you guys soon. See ya.